Okay. All right. Um, pull up the notes. Let me uh, get started on this note so I can finish from here. Uh, and if you're still working on that, just hold on to it. Just turn it in when you get done. So uh, the second part of section two here, and most of the first and second section of this chapter are basically kind of making comparisons to uh, between the early Middle Ages and the High Middle Ages, and things have changed. So we had talked about things, and we had talked about like you know, rise of population, rise of cities, rise of trade. Uh, yesterday was mainly kind of like the kind of the uh, reforms within the kind of the Catholic Church and stuff like that. Uh, generally, pretty positive for the most part. Uh, and then one of the things that uh, we talk about, like kind of the separation between early middle, remember the early Middle Ages is often referred to as the Dark Ages, is that there's a loss of like kind of like learning with the loss of a common language and all that other stuff. Um, Europe is a little bit kind of behind in certain things, like for example, paper. Um, what we kind of consider paper, like you know, the, the, the style that we use today, made out of pulp and like trees and plants and stuff like that, has their origin, it has its origins in East Asia, right? Uh, and so it doesn't really make it to as a kind of a common uh, kind of means of kind of, uh, you know, documenting information until about this period, like about the 11th century, kind of tail end there, the 10 hundreds. Um, there was papyrus that where the, where paper comes from it has its origins in Egypt, but that was rather expensive. Generally, kind of people they usually kind of um, and it also to keep in mind with education here is that um, we get this impression that the entire like early Middle Ages there was no learning going on. It's a little misleading. Uh, during the time of Charlemagne, we talked about something called the Carolingian Renaissance. Charlemagne encouraged like scholars from other parts of Europe to come uh, to the Frankish kingdom. He understood that he needed like kind of like you know, a literate part of his population uh, and for record keeping, all right, for government uh, kind of positions and such. Because initially that came from the church, the monks and stuff like that, which were generally they were kind of only kind of people that had a high literacy rate. Um, starting around the 1100s, here, we, because of that whole like shift in kind of the nation state and the conflict between church and state at the time. We start to see kind of outside, uh, um, kind of like uh, like merchants and their sons and stuff like that, kind of start to emerge there. Uh, but like I said, the paper here, generally before the common kind of use of like, paper as we know today in Europe during the early Middle Ages, the most of the stuff was written either on parchment or vellum, which is basically animal skin. Vellum is just a finer form. You talk like calf skin, sheep skin, stuff like that. Um, this is very similar when I went to high school. The school I went to, we didn't have paper. We did have an animal reserve in the back. So your day usually started about four o'clock. You get up in the morning. Um, you go to the animal reserve and hunt for your elk or your deer for your parchment or vellum. Um, and then uh, you, I mean, it was unethical to give kids guns. So uh, the next best thing was, all, of course, with the wall bats with electrical tape. Around. And so then you take a couple hours to hunt and like basically beat to death your like your deer or your or your um. Oh, but by that time you're kind of ready, you're bloody sweaty, ready for, for school. So class would start, you had your kind of your, your parchment out. Um, and we didn't have pens, it was a small school, we didn't have pens or pencils. Um, so um, the next best thing, of course, was we had to write in our own blunt. So usually what you did was you bit off the tip of your finger, kind of wrote, and that's why I don't have any like, like there's no fingerprints all like on, the, on my index finger anymore. Um, it wasn't uncommon to so basically pass out a couple times during class. We did get iron supplements during lunch. Uh, so that kind of helped out. And um, basically what we have with nuns, we just basically stay up there and talk. When you write on the board, they have like weird accents and you just basically have to write out what you thought that they said. Uh, and then when we left, we would basically have to like basically thank them for educating yeah. us all day. Uh, so um, you kids have it easy with your Chromebooks and your ham radios and your cell phones and your fax machines and your pens and papers. We didn't have it when I was growing up in the late 80s. Yeah. Half of those things you just said are obsolete. What's that? Uh, Ham uh, radios. Ham radios? No, nope, there's fax. Still have radios. You probably drive the, behind some fax machine. machine. Fax machine. Oh yeah, I just used the fax the other day. Yeah, real talk. Yeah, that's the, you'll, you'll find out. That, that <laughs> All right. Um, do you ever have like your parents tell you these stories? Like you know, like I had my dad one time. I complained about getting on the bus when I was a kid, and he's like, you know, I didn't have a bus when I was your age, and he walked, so I walked to school. And one point, you know, the whole uphill thing. He didn't go uphill oh, all the way, but <laughs> he did walk up a hill one day. And when he got to the top of the hill, one of his friends just not for fun threw a glass bottle in his face. That's why he said he had scars on there. So um, it's a similar story, but you guys, you kids have it easy. Uh, and so this is kind of parchment, uh, vellum. Uh, like you said, it's you know very thin, but it limits the amount of kind of like written information that we had in Western Europe at the time compared to what's going on in East Asia, the Middle East, even West Africa. We talk about Mali and stuff like that. 
So by the kind of like the 11th and the 12th century, paper as we know it became a little bit more common. But still, there you had people kind of handwriting this. We don't talk. We don't talk about the printing press until we get to like the Reformation era. Uh, and so there was a lot of like some. And a lot of these were monks uh, that were kind of scribes and stuff like that. A lot of them are very ornate, kind of like in the kind of around the margins. Um, that seems like a little bit of an unnecessary O, but that's what that's supposed to be. All right. Um, and so, uh, like I said, it's mainly handwritten. Uh, I did find this video is actually interesting about uh, these illuminated manuscripts, as they're known. And uh, why there's always, they're not always, but there's a lot of snails in there. We've all been there. After a long day of work, you sit down and binge read some Arthurian romances. They're called illuminated manuscripts because they're illuminated with illustrations in the borders, colorful drawings, and very special doodles in the margins. But among all those steroidal rabbits and this hooded person laying literal eggs, there's actually a theme. A lot of medieval knights in these manuscripts are fighting snails. Why is this happening? The largest snail alive is 15.5 inches, snout to tail. So why does this knight look like he's in for the fight of his life? Illuminated manuscripts were handwritten. Scribes painstakingly transcribed the same Bibles, devotionals, and stories. They also decorated the margins. By the 1960s, one scholar thought these margins were worth attention. Lillian Randall was particularly intrigued by the snail in Gothic marginal warfare. She developed a theory about why a book like this might include a winged knight fleeing snails and why it showed up again and again and again. Randall found more than 70 snail fighting heroes in just 29 manuscripts, most of which were made between 1290 and 1310. Pray for yourself, Knight. Pray that the snail will kill you quickly. Sometimes the margins riffed on the text, sometimes they were disconnected, but Randall connected them to historical stereotypes. The biggest was that the Lombards were greedy, mean, and cowardly. The Lombards were a Germanic people that had invaded Italy. They were warriors, but in 772 they were badly beaten by Charlemagne. That permanently stained their reputation. By the late 1200s, when those snail pictures started getting popular, the Lombards had become lenders and pawnbrokers spread throughout Europe. They didn't have full rights, they couldn't even own arms, but they did have power. That combination of power and impotence, Randall argued, made them targets. Snail was the appropriate insult. Snails carried their houses on their backs as they retreated, just as the Lombards had from Charlemagne. They were slimy, like a lot of Europeans probably saw their lenders. Calling Lombards snails was an anti-foreign slur that later grew into a bigger trope. It appeared in what was probably a medieval pattern book, with models that helped other scribes draw. And snails showed up in many different combinations later on. Here's a snail monkey rabbit battle royale from the 1400s. Snails were slow, but they spread. We can't be certain what the knights and snails meant because they meant different things as the image became a cliché. The same way people don't explain their memes today, scribes didn't annotate their games in the margins. Randall's argument fits with the timing and history. But people also speculate that snails represented the slowness of time or the insulation of the ruling class. We can only be certain about one thing. The snails reveal something, along with everything else in the margins. As scribes labored over transcriptions of hallowed works, reproducing every line, they snuck in additions, jokes, and riffs in the margins of the text. The drawings were fantasies, but they were made by artists who sought to parody the indignities and absurdities of their own world. The margins were the only space left, so they turned them into a self-portrait. Except for this guy, he's just going to get murdered by a snail. 
So this video just scratches the surface when it comes to weird medieval art and possible interpretations. Michael Camille wrote a whole book about art in the margins, and he highlights one figure. It's the gorillas, and he's supposed to represent bodily appetites. It's very cute and a little disgusting. So, um, as we see, kind of like how like Europe, Western Europe was a little bit behind on the kind of the arrival of paper, um, we also see it's a little bit behind over the concept of universities, which most of the, it, the Middle East had these dated back to the kind of the golden age of Islamic history. In East Asia, you would have it. Essentially, the definition for universities is just like a group of scholars, like people are trying to get together. Like, you could argue, like, maybe even like, you know, um, Plato's Academy was kind of like a university to a certain extent. But, um, when they consider the first university in Western Europe was in Bologna in Italy, um, it's debatable when it technically started. They claim that a group kind of got together to discuss intellectual endeavors about 1058. It wasn't until the middle part of the 12th century, the 1100s, that it was officially kind of chartered as a university uh, by the Holy Roman Emperor uh, Frederick I, Barbarossa. All right. uh, one of the things that, would, that attracted people to Bologna was that it did have a copy of the uh, Code of Justinian, which we talked about last chapter. Uh, which was kind of like kind of opened up a kind of concept of law schools. Uh, then soon after Bologna, you have the Sorbonne in Paris, and then Oxford and Cambridge in England. All right, and also a lot of the you know the, while the kind of the uh, enrollment was relatively small, this also coincides with the rise of the merchant class. A lot of merchants, uh, kind of wealthy merchants, would send their sons uh, to these schools. Now later, women were allowed to enter. Actually, Bologna was the first university in Europe. That a woman who graduated who also became a professor there. Her name was Patizia uh, Gozandini. Uh, she, I believe, taught science. All right. Uh, so um, this is uh, Bologna in Italy, in northern uh, in northern Italy. There, uh, the kind of medieval square. The university still exists today. Uh, there's still an old area of it. Um, it's more of a modern university, though. Uh, and then, like what you see, education hasn't really changed a whole lot. Uh, what I found this is kind of interesting here is that um, like you have a person, like the professor kind of, you know, up there kind of reading from a, from a book. Uh, the students are basically paying attention. Some are talking. I like this dude. He's just basically sleeping. So I come from a long history of people putting people to sleep. This is true. I'm doing it right now. It's almost like I can do it in my sleep myself. All right. Um, and then this is from Cambridge in England. And uh, notice what they're wearing in class here. This is basically what you guys pay Jostens for. All right, the cap and gown concept actually that's what students wore in these university settings when it transcends to just strictly graduation i'm not totally sure these guys walking around essentially they're basically with staffs so are making sure that the students are on task if you will all right uh and we also have like reports on like if you guys go away to school like in colleges there's also like you know the uh, people they call townies that live in the college town there was conflict between like you know um like you know townies and, and students Cap and gown, what they called it, uh, cap and gown versus town. And uh, there was incidents of kind of drunken brawls that you find sometimes in college town. So not all that whole has changed, per se, if you will. Um, what we see here is like this is the beginning of kind of like a liberal education, as you will. Um, you have various disciplines, science, mathematics. One of the more popular ones, obviously, because this is religion plays a core role, is theology, right? And primarily kind of Christian theology, obviously. But we also start to see kind of college as a place where now people like just like kind of like to try to find themselves and basically kind of in, are introduced into kind of like new uh, new uh, new disciplines and stuff. So we start to see a mixing of kind of Christian doctrine and philosophy, all right? And they refer to that as scholasticism, and that becomes popular kind of towards into we get into like the 13th into the 14th century here. Um, what we found is that um, this is mainly kind of philosophy for Greece, all right? And what Europeans benefited from was the fact that in Toledo, Spain, which was controlled by Muslims, there was an extensive library. Remember, the Islamic world maintained manuscripts from Plato and Aristotle. Without that maintaining of that, we wouldn't have information that would kind of spear the, spear the Renaissance. So in Toledo, you had Jew, uh, Jewish scholars who would translate Arabic copies of Greek writers into, into Latin like such as Aristotle and Plato, and they would make their way to Western Europe. A prime kind of example of this, and a person that we can kind of consider the bridge between the Renaissance and the medieval age, is St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, Aquinas was a Dominican, he was a monk, not a friar, but he was a Dominican, uh, who basically taught at the University of Sorbonne, but other places, but mainly in Paris. And he's also, like, if you guys go away to college, you'll find you, some of your professors, another thing that they do is they write, all right, they're published and such. So, uh, Aquinas kind of it was kind of starts that kind of tradition. Uh, he wrote say he writes a, a, a book called Summa Theologiae, which is basically the heights of theology, 
which uses kind of reason and logic faith, you know, like Aristotle, um, and kind of backs, you know, uses that to back up kind of Christian doctrine. Like I said, it's bridging the kind of the kind of the Renaissance with the medieval age. All right. And so um, when we say like those in the Renaissance refer to those in the Dark Ages as just like they lately they just discovered all this stuff. It's a gradual kind of like kind of progression that we go through here. All right. And so uh, there's Aquinas. In one hand, he's holding his book, uh, High Theology. The other hand, he's holding the building that represents the university where he was taught. It was mainly in Paris. All right. Um, now, Latin was the primary language that taught in, edu in, uh, in universities. Like in Paris, um, there's, a, there's a place still today called the Latin Quarter. That's the area where the university was at because that's where students would speak Latin. But, but you know, uh, enrollments are relatively low. Uh, these are mainly kind of the sons and daughters of merchants uh, or nobles and stuff like that. Um, people in their everyday life are not speaking Latin on a kind of continuous basis. They'll hear it in church maybe. but. Uh, we start to see kind of literature and poetry reflect where people are at with when writing and paper become more common, uh, and the writing of what we call vernacular, which is a language of everyday kind of like you know like so for example like Chaucer's uh, Canterbury Tales is a prime example of that, right? Written in Old English, uh, and so this becomes more of the kind of everyday person's kind of like uh, kind of readings, all right? And a lot of that kind of harkens back to kind of hero stories from the past, all right? Um, kind of a, in France, they would refer to these kind of like poems and stories as chansons de guest, which were songs of deeds, which are a lot of like kind of rooted in kind of the kind of early Middle Ages. Um, some of them, the troubadours would kind of recite using musical instrumentation and such, right? So these were like kind of the marble, like or the like DCs of their of their time. They were the more popular ones. They weren't dealing with kind of heady philosophical theories and such. They were basically telling stories of knights and heroes and damsels and things of that nature, right? That's another thing which kind of also kind of propagates that whole knight in shining armor kind of concept, if you will, all right? Um, let's see, what time we got? Yeah, I'm gonna skip that. I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna show this video on, on King Arthur, but I'm gonna skip that. Uh, so uh, two prime examples of that. One is a true example would be uh, the Song of Roland, which is a true chef song that guess has origins in France. This tells of a kind of medieval knight who kind of uh, had his fatal teeth to uh, Charlemagne, dies fighting the Muslims, the Moors from Spain. Uh, if there was a role in he probably would not have died fighting the Moors. The timeline doesn't fit that bad. It would probably um, die fighting bandits. That was what the Norman knights actually sang, recited as they crossed the English Channel in the uh, invasion of England. And then the one that's more closer to us um, in kind of like concept here would be King Arthur, which was developed at this time written down from legends and stories dating back to the Roman era by a guy named Joffrey of Magna. Um, so the video I was going to show, we're going to talk about that, how it kind of connects all these various kind of legends and stuff like that together in one story to kind of inspire people and such. But I'll skip that because we won't get into it. So tomorrow, starting tomorrow, um, I'm going to move on to the section where so far we've been talking about the positive aspects of kind of the transition from early to high middle ages. Tomorrow, I'm going to start talking about the events that have marked the later part of the High Middle Ages, starting uh, with the Black Death. So we we'll are talking about a pandemic in the middle of the pandemic. That's some pretty heavy stuff. So, it is very meta. It sounds like some pandemic section. It is. Matter of fact, 